Well, hey, everybody. Thanks for being here. Uh, and I'm just glad I get to end out this series together. It was amazing getting here from Michael and Casey. And I just kind of loved how uh, we planned that. And I know I'm kind of tooting my own horn there. But uh, our team really just said, well, let's, let's hear from a couple different perspectives about the Bible and about, uh, like, what do we do with the Bible and each individual's uh, idea about it. So it's just been really neat. So thanks for being in that journey with us. Um, and the whole premise kind of started with this idea of a lot of us know Bible stories, but very few of us know the story of the Bible, the big overarching story and how we got the story, I would argue is almost as important as the story itself because there's so much more meaning and there's so much more depth than just a book that was written thousands of years ago. And, and I'll have just a moment of confession for me. I've been a Christian uh, really all my life. My parents raised me as a Christian before I was even born. Um, so I always had a Bible and I always had like, I guess, belief in God, but I never really understood what the depth of the Bible was until recently, if I'm being really honest. And I, I went to college for this and I studied the Bible and I went, you know, until recently, it's really just taken on a new meaning. And this is one of my favorite Bibles that I have. I have lots of them. Um, it, this is a little guy, but he's been through a lot with me and uh, I've taken notes in him. You can see a lot of like little writings in here, if you can see there. Uh, there's lots of Star Wars references in here. I went through a Star Wars phase, but uh, as I was working through all this, I was learning more and more about the Bible and the depth. And then recently it was just one of those things of like, whoa, there is so much more to the Bible than we actually sometimes give it credit for. When you look at the story of the Bible and not just Bible stories. So maybe that's you. Maybe you've been a Christian, but then you're going, well, maybe there's more to it. And I just want to encourage you. There is so much more to this book than what meets the other. So much more adventure, so much more meat. There's so much more uh, just meaning and purpose and so much connectivity between scripture and our lives and different parts of scripture to other parts. I mean, it's just incredible to look at. So tonight we're going to dive right into that idea of there is so much connectivity between us and our day-to-day -day lives in the Bible. And you may believe that, you may not, but hopefully as we go through a couple of things, you'll go, oh, that's the connection maybe. But here's, here's another struggle I think sometimes we have with the Bible. The way you got your Bible is different than the way the world got its Bible. Because when I got my Bible, I was handed a Bible. It was all done. It was tidied up. There's chapters. There's a table of contents. There's definitions. There's things in here that really just kind of clean it all up. But it's not how it started, though. If you've been following with us in this series, you heard from Michael a couple weeks ago and Casey that it wasn't always that pretty. It wasn't always that put together and tidied up like we get our Bibles today. And another thing maybe that is a struggle about the Bible is the, what you were told when you were handed your Bible about the Bible. And sometimes people get the message of, here's your Bible, read it, respect it, it is holy, there are no questions about it, read it, respect it, holy. Some people are given a Bible and you go, well, don't read that. Uh, that's for priests, that's for the holy of holy people, they'll tell you what's in this, but here's a Bible, put it on your shelf. Or maybe you never got a Bible. Maybe you've been raised without a Bible or you, you're new to the whole Christian thing, you're going, what is the Bible? But you probably have an idea about something from scripture, something about a Bible somewhere, the holy book, whatever you want to call it. For me growing up, um, it was Bible races and like vacation Bible school. We would all have our little kids Bibles and they'd say, open up to numbers, whatever, whatever. And you're, oh, I got to get there fast. And you're like thumbing through the pages. We'd have races. We would tell each other stories from the Bible. Uh, and then when I got in middle school and high school, somebody told me, and, and this is not fact. This is just somebody, somebody told me, I don't know where they got it from, but don't put anything on top of your Bible. So like if you put it on your bedside table, don't put a cup on it or a piece of paper on it. If it's on your desk, don't put another book on top of it. I don't know why. There's no reason for that. So don't take that as your takeaway, but that was something that I was told. Don't put anything on top of it. And I did that for years. Then I realized, why am I doing that? It's not, that's not, there's nothing to that. It was somebody told me about it. Um, and then some people say, well, it's the final authority. Whatever it says, that's what it goes with. And this phrase might sound familiar to you. The Bible says it, that settles it. The Bible says it, that settles it. The Bible says it, that settles it. But for some of us, it doesn't settle it anymore. And that phrase, the Bible says it, that settles it, doesn't really connect because we have a hard time reconciling what does the Bible say and what's in the world around us. So maybe you've walked away. Maybe you just put the book on a shelf and said, well, the Bible says it, that doesn't settle it though. I've got questions. There's things that don't add up. There's things that don't connect between my life and the words on these pages. But I would argue somebody told you Bible stories, but they maybe didn't tell you the story of the Bible. 
So let me give you a little bit of background just to catch you up of what, what is the Bible? What are we looking at tonight? Uh, there's the Old Testament, and before it was called the Old Testament, it was just a Jewish text. It was the Law and the Prophets. That's what we had. That was the Jewish text, and that, the Law and the Prophets, was the backstory to the new story, which we call the New Testament now. And there's a leader that I look up to a lot. His name's Andy Stanley. You've probably heard of him. He's a famous pastor. And uh, I was listening to a, a sermon from him about this topic uh, uh, last week, a couple weeks ago. And he said this in just a really clear way. And so I want to put this up on the screens. But he says, when the Gentiles became enamored with a particular Jew, they became enamored with the sacred text of the Jews. So when the Gentiles, when non-Jewish people, when just average everyday people, they, they became enamored with Jesus, they became enamored with the sacred text of the Jews, which is the law and the prophets. Because Jesus was Jewish, because they wanted to know their story, if they're going to follow Jesus, what's Jesus's story? That was the law and the prophets. And so that's where we get the Old Testament from. But I want to ask us tonight, right, we, we get all that. What's the reason we have the Bible though? Like the Jewish text or the Jewish text, but what's the reason we have the Christian Bible? And then more importantly, I want us to get to where is my part in this story? What's the reason for it? What's my part in this story? So the first one, what's the reason for it? Uh, long story short, like Jesus, uh, I, we could just start there. And somebody didn't just sit down and say, well, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to write the Bible today. And they sat down and Luke was one of the, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, four gospels. He was the first one to start it. He didn't sit down and go, okay, I'm writing the Bible. He sat down and he wrote letters. He wrote down thoughts because when it became clear that Jesus was the guy, when it became clear that Jesus pulled off the impossible, something significant happened and it needed to be written down. That's the New Testament. When it became clear that something happened, that he was who he said he was, when Jesus died, believe it or not, the story was over. There was no story anymore when Jesus died. There was no Bible. There was no story. There was no reason to sit down and write anything down until Jesus rose from the dead, until the resurrection, because that proved that he was who he said he would be. And so Luke was one of the first guys, like I said, to sit down and write this down, but he wasn't writing the Bible. Luke just started his chapter and his book just like this, and it's Luke chapter 1, verse 1. It says, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. And a word in there that's really specific is many. Not just me, not just Luke, many people have undertaken. Nobody did that in that day. If you were writing something down, if you were taking notes, it wasn't many. It would be like Luke wrote it this down because it was important to him. But many people wrote down this account. And then he goes on to say a little bit after that, um, just some other words that in like verse two and three that I didn't put up on the screen, but he says, I want to make an orderly account. I want to investigate from the beginning. I want you to know with certainty because something extraordinary happened and it's got to be saved. It's got to be written down because when the tomb was discovered empty, when the hundreds of people that followed Jesus ran into the streets saying he's alive, that proved that something significant happened. It's because of those events that the, life, that the life and the teachings of Jesus really mattered and became more and more important because until the resurrection, he was a teacher, he was a prophet, he was the Messiah, but they just didn't know it yet. But with the resurrection, it happened. It was true. And everything that Jesus taught, everything that Jesus lived and said and did became more important. And it was the reason that somebody sat down and documented these events. So that's the New Testament. And there were four different accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then after that, Paul, Peter write lots of letters, John, James, lots of people are writing down documents about this first Jesus movement. And John is the last of the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John wrote his gospel last. And I always think it's interesting. Like why, why would John write his gospel? We had three accounts of the same event. Like why, why did John's exist? What's the reason for it? We already had it. Why did he do it? And he tells us at the end of his book in John chapter 20, verse 31, it says, but these are written so that you, and that you is not me and you. These things are written that John says in that verse, these things are written so that you, not us, but you is his family, his friends, his community. He wasn't writing the Bible. John didn't sit down to write the Bible for generations. He was writing a document for his people for his family, his friends, his community, because when we believe that Jesus is the Messiah, Son of God, 
And by believing this, you may have eternal life in his name. If John's account is all you have, John's account was all that you would need. That's why he wrote it, because it was so personal. It was so important to him. Now, maybe this is changing and reframing how you see the Bible. Maybe you're going, well, I've, I've never seen the Bible like that. I thought somebody just sat down and like wrote Christianity. People wrote down their personal experiences because something significant mattered and it couldn't be lost because it was important. And it's not just a history book. It's not something that somebody wrote down, but there's way more heart and way more purpose behind it. And then that brings me to my second point that I want to make. When there's more heart, when there's more purpose, when the reason for the Bible matters, then all of a sudden, what is our response to this story? What's our response to the reason the Bible was written? And it's alive, it's active. That might sound churchy and like a weird thing, like the Bible's alive and active. No, it's a book, it sits on my shelf. No, the Bible is really still changing things today when we live it out and it's still affecting things today. So what's our part in the story? And that takes a little bit of background for us to answer. And I wanna start with a guy named Paul. Paul's one of my favorite characters in scripture and uh, he writes most of the New Testament actually. And I would say Paul probably influences most of Western civilization, whether you know it or not, with this cultural foundation, with social structure, with the golden rule. There's a lot of reasons that Paul is important. He writes most of the New Testament. And the first thing is he actually wrote it. When he was writing these letters, he wasn't writing the Bible, but he was writing to his friends and individual churches and other Christians after the resurrection of Jesus. Paul's saying, hey, I'm, I'm leading this first church movement. I'm leading the Jesus movement. Let me write you a document to help you figure this stuff out in life. And then the second reason Paul's important for us as to finding our place in the story is because he explains the relationship between the Old Testament and the New Testament because he used the Old Testament and the New Testament in a lot of his writings. He points things out um, from his writings and says, hey, remember back in the Law and the Prophets, those Jewish texts that you think are really important because they were Jesus's texts? Remember what they said there? Well, Jesus lived that out here. And I try to do that a lot when I preach of, of showing, okay, here's a principle that was taught and it ties back to the Old Testament. And Paul did that a lot when he was writing. And I think when Paul, if Paul were here today and Paul were handing out Bibles, uh, if Paul were to give you your Bible, I think Paul would have a couple things to say to us. Uh, for me, I, like I said, somebody told me, don't put anything on top of this. I don't think Paul would say that. I think Paul would say a couple other things. He'd hand you the Bible and say, hey, read the Old Testament for inspiration and motivation and take your cues, take your application cues, take your life cues from the new command of Jesus. And that's the New Testament. Take the Old Testament, read the Old Testament for inspiration and motivation. That's our heritage, that's our history, that's Jesus's history, not application because the story changed. Take your application cues from Jesus's new covenant in scripture in the New Testament. And Jesus' new covenant is uh, in John chapter 13, and he's in the upper room with his disciples, and they're getting ready to kind of hear the truth from Jesus. And Jesus says, well, here's the thing, John 13, a new command I give to you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Another. You think loving one another was a big deal for him? I mean, he said it like four times in that text. Um, but what he's saying is, a new command I give you. This is the platinum rule. This stands above all else. This stands first. Don't put this rule of love one another in the bucket with all the other commands and all the other laws and all the other prophets and then like dump it out on the floor and try to deal with it all together. Jesus says, this is the new command that I give to you. Love one another. It stands first. And church, when... When have we gotten that right? When have we gotten that right every single day? There's days where I get it right and there's days where I get it wrong. So where's our part in the story of the Bible? To get that right, to love one another. The New Testament centers around the, the person of Jesus and Jesus says, love one another. When Paul's saying and writing all these letters, he's writing to churches and individuals and he's giving them application points. He's saying, do this, don't do this, try this, lead this way, do these things. Those letters are simply giving application points to the new command of Jesus of love one another. The whole New Testament is examples and application and living out 
the new command from Jesus. And Jesus is the whole point of the things even written to begin with. Because of his resurrection, because of his teachings, that's the reason that somebody sat down to write it. They didn't write the Bible. They didn't write Christianity. They wrote about Jesus because he pulled off the impossible. He said he was going to do something and he did it. He was who he said he was going to be. And that what's, that's what makes his life and his teachings so much more valuable. And that's why they're written down. So where's your part in the story? To look at the new command. To look at scripture as application and examples and ways to live that out. And there are things in scripture, there's examples, there's things to do, there's laws in scripture, there's things that Paul writes about that aren't really in effect in our culture anymore because our culture is different than when Paul wrote, but they're still helpful. There's things in our lives and in our culture that aren't written about in scripture. Social media is a great example of that. Social media is not in scripture, but the Bible is still helpful with application points to our lives because we look at the relationship and the heart behind the application because it all points to love one another. It all gives that example. Casey talked about that last week with how do we read the Bible? Look at the context. Look at who Paul was writing to. And our culture is different to the culture he was writing to. He wasn't writing the Bible for you. He was writing a letter to a church or to an individual. And we can take our application cues from Paul. And we're inspired and motivated by the Old Testament, sure. But we get our application cues from the New Testament. All the letters, all the notes, they poured their heart into writing these documents. And it wasn't just the Gospels. It wasn't just Paul. There was a guy named Peter. Uh, He was illiterate but he dictated all of whatever he wrote to somebody else. And they wrote down Peter's experience of Jesus and the way to apply life to the new command. And then there's a guy named uh, James. James is Jesus's brother. Think about your siblings. If you had to write a book about your siblings, what would you put in that? It might not make it into the Bible, but James believed that his brother was the savior of the world. And James wrote, James wrote a letter about it, and it survived antiquity. It survived the, the gathering of these letters together and making the Bible. And all of these letters, all of Scripture, falls into four categories. And it's, the, it's valuable, it's reliable, it's sacred, and it's inspired. And it's valuable not because they were writing the Bible. It's valuable because of who was writing it and what they wrote. Who was writing it were people that were close to Jesus. And what they were writing pointed to the new command of love one another. It's valuable for those reasons. Let me give you a quick history lesson and we'll wrap up in just a moment. But in fourth century uh, CE, Constantine was a ruler in that time. He lifted the ban on religious texts. He lifted the ban on religious teachings and the law and all that kind of stuff. And that allowed scholars to work out in the open with these documents. It wasn't the Bible yet. It was letters that were valuable and sacred and inspired. And they were immediately valuable. It wasn't like hundreds of years later, we found all these documents and went, ooh, these are valuable. As soon as they wrote them, they were protected and they were passed around from community to community. And you maybe got a part of a letter. You might not have gotten the whole thing, but that person would hold on to that and you'd pass it on to the next person. You'd make a copy, you'd send it to the next place. Immediately, these letters were valuable because of who they were writing about and what they said. And so in fourth century, they lifted the band, scholars could work on it. And then this is just so interesting. The same empire that crucifies Jesus funds and pays for the gathering and copying and binding together of all of these documents about Jesus's life. How incredible is that? The same empire funds the gathering of this and they put it all together in what's called the Tabiblia. And that's a Greek word that stands for the Bible or the books. We call it the Bible. To Biblia is the books. We call it the Bible. And then in the late fourth century, it's all bound together. And it changed Western civilization. I'll tell you, it changed my life. And maybe it's changed your life as well. All because of the resurrection. And somebody decided to write it down because it was so significant. And then people after that are giving us application cues to love one another. So where's your part in the story of the Bible? Where do you see the Bible fitting into your life? And that same message that Andy gave about the Bible, he said this, and it's just worded so perfectly, so I have to give him credit. He said, the Bible did not create Christianity. Hmm. Let that sink in maybe. The Bible did not create Christianity. Christianity can stand on its own, but Christianity is the result of an event, the resurrection, that created a movement, the church, 
that produced sacred and reliable texts, the letters, the gospels, Paul, Peter, produced texts that were collected and protected and bound into a book, the Bible. That's what Christianity is a result of. It's a story worth telling because it's a story of every generation. It's the story of you. It's the story of me. And the story of the Bible reminds us that the most important question isn't to ask, am I at peace with everything that's written in this book? Am I at peace with the examples and the, and the laws in the Old Testament and New Testament? Am I at peace at this? That's not the most important question. The most important question is, are you looking at this as a lens to see into the heart of God and the mind of God? Are you at peace with the God who sent his son to die on the cross and to be rose from the dead? Are you at peace with Jesus, the reason that people sat down to write these documents so that you can have a relationship and eternal life with your heavenly father? Because that's where our lives and our story intersects with the story of the Bible. Let me pray for us. God, I thank you so much that you give us the Bible, not just as this old book that's just getting dust on our shelves, but God, you give us the Bible as an example. That the reason it was written, the reason it was so important is because your son did the impossible. And we get to follow in his footsteps. We get to learn from his example and his life and his teachings were written down and saved because it changed the world. So for us, as we look at our Bible this week, as we pick one up out in the lobby, as we do whatever we're going to do with our Bible this week, I pray that we can see this book with a brand new set of eyes. That it's not just an old book that somebody sat down to write, write, but it's a book that we get to continue living out each and every day. That we get to read application points, that we get to read examples and real life stories from real life people who were changed by Jesus. God, help us to see ourselves in this story and to take a step and to live differently because of it. We love you. Thank you for loving us. Amen.